Ausbuchung aus der Bayerner Begriff maximal von 8 Tops und 13 Grad. Zahle von Bayer in het Westen en Noordwesten elders blijven droog. Het is ook 10 graden dan. Elke dag is het in richting Staafhoek is de rechterhand stof gestemd door een onderwand in de Bever te lopen. Richting Gent wordt het lastig. Het is een hoogte die vervalt via dit van Luxen. Het linker is stof gestemd door een onderwand stad via de Antwerpen Noord. Tijd de zaak van Beckham tot Antwerpen Zuid. Richting Nederland is de naam niet te moeten tot de Kennedy tunnel. Ook de zaak in de naar Antwerpen op de E17 vanaf Kuipeken en op de E19 vanaf de Zorg in de Hello, uh, I suppose we can start. Yes, I was about to say the same. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. thank so, you um, <laughs> thanks again for, for being here today. Um, this webinar is about Open Minded, which is a very interesting project about text and data mining. And I leave the floor to uh, Andrea Nati Pavlidou uh, to, to give us the first round of introduction about the project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, welcome all. Uh, this is a, an overview of what we will see today. I hope you'll see my screen. Yeah, the outline is that, okay, a brief introduction. Then we have session one, which is about content providers. So we'll have the legal view. Uh, Thomas will explain more. Uh, then you will hear about what, what's happening between open air and open-minded because open air is a content provider, it's open-minded. Uh, then uh, the publisher's view will follow. And then we have our next session, which is about researchers. Uh, researchers are the core users of Open Minded. So you have, uh, for me again, an overview of how we build, how we process and store a corpus in Open Minded. And then a demo uh, on a use case. And then we have some few minutes for questions uh, you may have. And also we have uh, uh, an Open Minded also colleague that can explain more on TDM if you need. So uh, the names is Thomas for the from uh, Creating University of Glasgow for the legal, uh, then me Muppet Workers from Frontiers, and then uh, again from me you hear some info about open air open minded, Blair Nedrick from Inra, and questions. So it was really brief. Uh, so we save time and Thomas can continue. Uh, and I think I have to make Thomas a presenter now. So Thomas, you're here, right? I, I'm here, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I have a nice pop-up telling me what to do to share my screen uh, yeah. in order to show my slides, which is something if I had known I would have done before. Um, Give me a second, sorry. <clears throat> okay, I probably need someone to tell me whether right now you are seeing my slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is placed correctly. Oh, okay. yes. um, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll be uh, uh, briefly uh, talking about what uh, repositories can do in order to favor uh, open uh, science practices. This, is, uh, this presentation is mostly based on uh, uh, open science checklist for repositories that we have been developing within uh, um, open-minded and open-air 
uh, and now has achieved the uh, uh, first release stage. So to start with, uh, uh, I'll start with something that by now I'm sure everyone knows very well, which is the open access definition. I think it's important to remind us all uh, uh, that there is a definition, that the definition is quite clear on what is open access and what is not. Um, I put in bold the parts that I think are particularly uh, relevant. Um, I don't think we need to go through it, but again, let me remind you that uh, uh, elements such as uh, uh, non-commercial uh, do not comply with the open access uh, definitions. So this is something that has a very, uh, plays a very important role when we uh, talk about licenses. <clears throat> so why do we need a license and why it is important for repositories to um, play, to put licenses uh, on their um, website nowadays mostly? There are a few legal technicalities that uh, I hope uh, I was able to make them enough non-technical, but the first one that we have to understand it's that uh, copyright operates automatically. This is something very important, and this is something that distinguishes copyright from trademarks or patents, for example, where you have to go through a registration process in order to obtain that patent or that trademark. Copyright operates automatically. It's, uh, it's not an opt-in uh, system. You write something and you have the copyright. You don't need to register, you don't need to put your name on it, you don't need to put uh, uh, the symbol of a copyright, the famous uh, C with a circle. These are all things you can do if you want and you know can be useful, but they are not necessary. So this means that everything that fits into the definition of copyright, uh, which is basically an original expression of an idea. Um, examples are many literary works, all the, the scientific uh, articles that, uh, that are produced, or maps, or uh, books, monographs, or software, or databases. Mm -hmm. There are so many. All these are automatically protected by copyright if they are original. And the original is the standard, honestly, for things such as journals, uh, article, it's, it's, we could say low to a point where almost any journal article is protected by copyright and this should be our starting point. All that we reuse is very likely protected by copyright. On the other side, however, the counterbalance to copyright, uh, which is an essential element to copyright, that is to say exceptions and limitations, uh, are not uh, um, are not uh, strong enough in terms of scope and in terms of number to allow us to actually rely on them on a generalized basis. This is uh, very unfortunate because they play a very important role. Let me be clear here: exceptions and limitations are, are very important and they still play a very relevant role in what we are allowed to do in terms of scientific activities every day. The problem is that, especially in the European Union, where we don't have a broad uh, concept uh, uh, such as fair use in the United States, but we have a limited and closed list of very specific exceptions and limitations, to reuse those articles uh, is often necessary to have a different type of authorization. So not an exception or a limitation, but a license from the copyright holder. So because copyright is so broad and because exceptions are so uh, narrow, then we need a license. And a license is uh, something very easy. It's basically a permission. Hmm? Everything is protected by copyright, so the default is all rights reserved. If there is no license, you cannot do anything with that uh, uh, journal article other than probably read it. 
and you have to read it with your own eyes. If you read it through the eyes of a software, probably you need a specific authorization. This is why it's so important that uh, uh, all uh, scientific products uh, have a license. Um, and it's only through the use of uh, the right licenses that we can achieve uh, uh, open, uh, open access in scientific publishing. So under this point of view, repositories play a key role in ensuring that this happens and thus in promoting open science uh, principles. Given this framework, we thought it would be very important to answer the question, how can, be, uh, how can repositories become enablers of uh, open science uh, uh, best practices? So with this in mind, we developed uh, the open science checklist for repositories. Uh, you can see a screenshot here. Um, you can also notice that the lawyers are not really expert in uh, graphic design, but fortunately there are colleagues who are. So this is the, uh, the information, the link information that we need. But uh, very soon you will have this packaged in a very um, attractive uh, uh, graphical presentation, sorry. So here we identified six main uh, principles uh, and uh, what I want to do during the rest of this presentation is to go through them very briefly and then uh, uh, allow time for questions if there are any. So the six points that we have identified as the very important points is, are, you, you can see them on the screen, but basically um, apply the right license to your repository and this is not the same thing as applying the uh, license to the content of your repository. So this is something that often causes confusion, but both the repository and the content uh, often need a license. Don't forget the metadata. Metadata, it's uh, nowadays really available, but it's not uh, as widely used as it should be. As a corollary of point one, point three, all the content should be licensed. And how? Well, data and data sets should be licensed under a CC0 unless you really, really want to use a CC BY and you know what it means. And we'll see uh, this uh, with some more details later on. Other works of authorship, which is the expression we used to refer to articles, maps, images, uh, photographs, sounds, etc., should be licensed under a CC BY 4.0. And finally, let's keep in mind this is all directed to repositories and repositories managers. Um, repositories should recommend the best uh, license for open science purposes, but it's the user, the uploader, the right holder who should uh, manually choose the license. So very briefly, uh, why CC 4.0? Um, well, because it's an international standard. It is uh, recognized uh, by everywhere in the world, I would say. It's uh, well written because it uh, uh, has gone through a number of versions and revisions by um, lawyer experts in the field from everywhere in the world. It's expressed in three languages, in the usual legal language, so the real legal document, in a human language, so something imaging like a summary for non-experts that tells you very clearly what you can and cannot do, and in a machine-readable um, language, so metadata. So if you choose a Creative Commons license from the Creative Commons website, and if your repository, if you implement the chooser uh, following the guidelines, then the, the user, the uploader, will automatically obtain all these three documents, the legal one, the human summary, and the metadata. So this is very important. Um, again, CC licenses are constantly updated, which is also something very important. Um, as a consequence, for example, of this nowadays, the version 4.0, so it's very important to use the right version, 
also includes these weird rights, uh, some of which uh, we call uh, SGDR, which stands for SWI Generates Database Right, which is this weird uh, right that we have in the European Union that protects uh, uh, non-original databases and in fact extends to, to data. And again, CC BY, it's fully open access compliant. So these are the reasons why CC, it's, uh, um, it's one of the best licenses that you can choose for your repository. It's not certainly the only one, but, uh, but it's probably one of the best and certainly it's the international standard and uh, it's good to converge towards a standard to avoid what we call license proliferation which causes license incompatibility. Um, here, just if you are not familiar with the CC license chooser, uh, this is how the uh, human language, the commons deed, looks like. Hmm? Uh, you may not want to read uh, five, six pages of, uh, of license, but I think that this is a document that anyone can understand spending only a few seconds and having a very general but accurate understanding of what can and cannot be done with the license. Uh, as we said, this is the uh, full license that is connected to the human uh, uh, language, to the common state. Sorry. So if you click uh, in, uh, on the link license, you obtain the license. And then you have the third language, which is the, uh, the, the metadata which you can apply uh, to your work. In all of this, it's automatically obtained if you, if you use the CC license chooser well and if you implement it in your, in your website or repository. Also, content should be licensed. So what is the difference between the repository and the content? The repository may or may not be, but often is uh, a database in the sense that a website or, or any other repositories that that collect uh, journal articles or databases or other elements can be in themselves protected by copyright. So applying a CC0 to the repository means that you license all the rights that can exist in that repository, meaning the copyright in the structure, the SWI generates database right in the content, are all very complex things, but you don't have to think about that if you apply a CC uh, 4.0. Plus, there is a problem, uh, however, that uh, uh, you, as a repository or repository manager, you probably don't own the copyright in the content, in the articles, right? So a very good way to solve this problem is to apply a CC BY with the uh, familiar expression unless otherwise noted. Sorry, something has happened unless otherwise noted, in a way that you're saying, you know, everything, so the default in this repository is CC by 4.0. However, if the right holder of a specific article chose a different license, then look at that specific license. In this way, you're not allowing open access to the single articles, but you are allowed open access also to that database, which is the repository that contains all of the information, all the articles. And, you know, just to give an example, you're basically saying to people, yes, you can text and data mine it. Papers, articles, songs, photographs, etc. We, as said, recommend again the same license, CC by 4.0, for the same reasons that we already seen. Um, we already analyzed uh, the reasons why it's so important and so good to use a CC license. So uh, we don't need to discuss this again. But please feel free to ask any question you may have. Uh, license proliferation is a problem which we try to address uh, in open-minded through uh, license compatibility metrics. Now we have a calculator that does that uh, um, automatically, so please refer to the open-minded website if you want to know more about this. For data, data set, and databases, we suggest a CC0 uh, rather than a CC BY, fully aware that CC0 doesn't require any attribution. Um, this is an open issue, uh, 
Um, I don't think that it's a good idea, and we can discuss why to apply a CC BY to data, which you know, on their own don't uh, don't ask for recognition for attribution. If you really want, you can always ask following uh, scientific and academic norms to be acknowledged as the author. And if you really, really, really want, you can sure you can use a CC BY, but you probably shouldn't. And finally, as a repository manager, um, put in place all these measures to allow your uh, users to choose the right license. But uh, there, there are a number of reasons why you should uh, let them choose the license and not choose them uh, yourselves. But you have uh, uh, an important role here to play, which uh, I like to call it an educative role towards researchers to explain them why it is so important to use the right licenses. And we have prepared a few documents and we are preparing uh, an additional set of documents that uh, help uh, users uh, to understand uh, why this license is the right one. So this is everything I wanted to tell you for today. Um, thank you very much. I hope I uh, uh, met the time requirements, and thank you. Thanks, Thomas. I'm now passing back the presentation rights to Androniti. Perfect. Thank you very much. So after we had our legal advisor, Thomas, in team, uh, we created open minded. So, what is open minded? Open minded is working on text and data mining for scholarly works, open access works. So, if you go to openminded.eu, you'll see our uh, website, and then you will see a list of services. All these services are registered already in Infra Central as well. So, you can find a catalog of corpora of TDM applications, components, uh, and secondary resources. You can build corpus, you can build TDM applications, uh, you can have uh, very good support and training, uh, also in collaboration with Foster, and you can also find uh, the work from uh, the legal uh, task force Thomas was leading uh, on consulting on TDM uh, license. And also TDM applications, you can execute TDM applications very easily with three steps. So. This is the portal, this is the infrastructure website, the services openminded.eu. But I would like to show you what is this all about. Give me a second, please. So, this is the openminded.eu. If you click services, you have a list, as I described. You will find the link to the platform, to the infrastructure. You'll find a user manual help text, training, feedback, and also for each service that we provide, we have a separate dedicated page that describes what is this all about. And also there is a link to that service, so it directs you exactly to the right path uh, of the infrastructure. So what is it for? Who is it for? Why? Just, I would like just to show you the one that Thomas described. So when we got the compatibility matrix from Thomas, we knew we had to create something to show it in a more friendly way. So you go to the service, and what you see in Open Minded is a license compatibility matrix, but in a different new user friendly form, which is what kind of content do I have? So my content is under this license. Okay, then I want to combine it with this license, or no, maybe this one. So are they compatible? No. So be careful, if you want to use DDM and if you want to combine different uh, corpuses in different corpora and create a corpus and then apply DDM, mm, you may not be able to. And also very fast, I would like to show you this, please. Okay, go to the platform, so it's services, open-minded. What we have here, here is the, is the platform that we can run the TDM that we're describing. So you have to register. When you do that, you will be able to sign in. 
So I will show you what happens. So you can select if you have an account from a university, you can select, or if you just have a social account, social network. And when you log in, what happens here is that and here is, you will see also what's the connection of open-minded and open-air. You can search for all the applications, components, corpora, uh, and more registered and open-minded, but also you can add corpora. So if you want to add corpora, you can build a new corpus. You can say, okay, I want to build one from open-air. And you can select, you can use a keyword I used Sentinel, I want to use to find the information about Sentinel data from uh, Copernicus satellites, for example. And then you can use the filters. And just to, to show you what happens, uh, if you use the filters, you have more results, and then you can run TDM. You can build a corpus. When you do that, there is a form that will ask you to describe the metadata. So what is this all about? What's your name? You have some things predefined already. So my name, my email. You have to set the version of this corpus. The, you have to set a license. If you don't, uh, it will not proceed. So you have to make sure you have CC BY, for example and then you register, and the process will be done automatically. So what happens now? It's working. So I will show you, if you're a content provider, since Open Air, as, as you saw, it provides content to Open, uh, open Air, provides content to Open Minded, what happens? So uh, the first step is that there is a content provider behind. Uh, go to provideopenair.eu and you will see this screen. And you will see uh, the validate and register options. So a content provider has to bring content to open air that has to be validated and then has to, re to be registered. And when it's registered, open minded is able to access that content. Uh, so you have four categories right now uh, where are working are uh, data sources for registration open. So one, two, three, four options. And when you, when you apply for to become a content provider, you have to agree with the terms and of, of agreement for content providers. Be careful, there is a button here that says, I would like to opt out from data mining. Please don't do that, because open-minded and uh, the TDM services of open air, it's internal services they won't be able to run. So please don't opt out. And what happens now when, uh, when you provide that content? So OpenAir has a content acquisition policy, which is really new, published 5th of October, and it describes for each case, for, for example, data repositories, they provide data set collections, clinical trials. Journals and publishers, they provide articles, preprint reports, and more. Uh, and for each case that, we, that you saw before, there is a specific set of guidelines. So if you click guidelines, openair.eu, you uh, read for each of these cases specific guideline. And then also you have, uh, there is a nice workflow. I will try to explain it uh, in an easy way. So when you're a content provider and you try to provide content to open air, the process is that there is a, an open air team and a repository manager that will communicate and they will try to find the best API parameter configuration. So if that works, you get the bibliographic metadata collection. And if that works, then uh, everything will be successfully validated from Open Air. That yes, uh, thank you very much. This is your score, and uh, now your content uh, uh, can be somehow in Open Air. If it doesn't work, if there is a, a mistake somehow in this process, then uh, this, this, the process starts from from start. Uh, after the validation, there, there has to be uh, a mapping. Uh, for example, uh, the content provider has the language uh, EN, but Open Mind, uh, Open Air uses the language ENG, uh, uses this keyword. So there is a configuration uh, and mapping of vocabulary management. And if that continues, is it correct? Yes. Then the metadata are fully 
let's say, uh, understandable for uh, open air also. When that happens, then there's the next step, which means, okay, we have the metadata, everything is correct. Now let's let's get the full text to open air. How, how that happens? Uh, again, there is uh, the content provider provides some links or information. Where is that content? Open Air team will, will, provide, will continue with the analysis and configuration of a plugin, download the full text. Texts. Uh, if there is no success, again, they have to start uh, from uh, step two. If everything is fine, then uh, your full text will be registered in uh, Open Air. And if you visit openair.eu and you go to provide and you have provided uh, content, then you will see, uh, let's say, a file, a, a nice graph that shows the history of the process. That yes, this content was uh, collected. Yes, there was a transformation. Yes, again, an update. And so you have a full overview of the process. So thank you very much. I hope I, I was really fast, but uh, quite uh, um, understandable. And now we we'll continue with Muppet, which is a content uh, represents frontiers as a content provider of open access. Thank you very much. Thanks, Androniki. So I just gave Muppet the presentations right. So let's wait for a second. Are you sharing my slide? Should I share my slide? Uh, can you repeat, please? Because I couldn't hear you very well. I'm sorry. I can share my slide. OK. OK. OK, hang on. Uh, You can probably just run the presentation and then uh, share your screen. That might be the easier way. Faster. Yes, I'm still setting up. Can you share my screen, please? No, not yet. Okay. Maybe Muppet lost connection. Yeah, exactly. Uh, seems okay, so. maybe I can go on and when she's back, she can continue. Uh, let's. Or wait. What do you think? Yeah, no, uh, we are now uh, viewing her screen, actually. Okay, no, just for a second. Uh, yeah, okay, just go on with the, with the next. Okay, so I can continue. Okay, what no, I uh, before? Uh, just wait for a second, Andrew, because I can now see Muppet okay. screen. Okay. However, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, Muppet, can you hear us? Okay, um, plan B, uh, just go on <laughs> with the next. 
<clears throat> so, uh, okay, so I continue until Muppet is back. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what you saw before, a few minutes ago, was how we build corpuses in open minded and we use open air for that. So, what happens? I went to open minded services, I used the corpus builder. Okay, my is back, so give me two minutes. And then when I used that, I had a successful message and an email that says, okay, uh, fantastic, you created your corpus. And when I do that, I want to show you. For example, what happens? I do that. I'm logged in. So under my profile, my corpora, I see what I created a few minutes ago. And if I want to share, and if I want to edit, and if I want to delete, uh, I can do it very easily. And if I want to go on and make it public, it's very easy. And then I can, and yet I can also publish to Zenodo directly from Open Minded to Zenodo. Of course, you have to follow uh, Open Minded guidelines every time you need. You don't know exactly what you should do, and also follow uh, just uh, user user manual. It's fantastic. It's very user friendly, and. Uh, I, I would recommend it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think Muppet can continue now, right? Yes, okay, let's hope that now it's working a bit quicker. Market, I gave you presentations right. Okay, cool. But we can hear you. Muppet, can you please try again and speak? Yeah, so we are experiencing a bit of technical issues in the sense that we can see the screen of markets, but we can hear air talking. Do you think that uh, we can give the floor to Claire and while... Well, okay, maybe, yeah, yeah. okay. Maybe, uh, Muppet, we don't hear anything. Uh, we can we can see your screen, but there's no sound. 
Uh, maybe we continue with Claire from okay. Canada, Natalie, and then map it history again. Thank you. Okay, Claire, you're now the presenter. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we share my, my screen with you. Um, I will present uh, um, the point of view of the of the researcher. Um, let me just uh, uh, okay. So I guess I just to click uh, on the little screen button. Uh, sorry, can you tell me where I should click to share my screen? Um, close to the microphone uh, button, you should see the screen button. And if yes. you click on that, you should be able to share the screen. Yeah, I'm clicking there, but nothing happened. I'm clicking on this uh, little, uh, little drawing, just... Uh, but nothing, nothing happened currently. Maybe you should grant me some. Uh, um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's try again. Yes. Um, Come on. Yeah. Now, now there's an issue. There's a conflict between you and Muppet. Oh, I see. Um, mm. Okay. Um, okay. Let's try now. You are the presenter right now. Now I click on this button again, but nothing has happened, so I cannot share my screen. see if there's something else I can do but um, as far as I can see from here you should have all the rights to oh, yes no okay. yeah okay it works Great. I suddenly see my, my screen can you see it yes okay very good it's working. <laughs> okay so open my kit for researcher um, I will uh, present uh, focused on uh, the agriculture and biodiversity domain, which was uh, one of the uh, community uh, domain of, uh, of open-minded. Um, so this is a very large domain. Obviously, I will not uh, present the, the whole domain, but to focus on the agri-food uh, systems. Um, you may know that the uh, agri-food systems is about a lot of different uh, subtopics like food production, environmental effects, food processing, nutritional value, etc., all along the food chain. And all these uh, systems create and uh, use knowledge. Um, and we know that open science-based knowledge systems uh, will stimulate the research and the innovation and increase the impact. And this is why we are interested in uh, open-minded. So the example I will give here of, uh, of a research activity based on open-minded is about uh, uh, the impact of open-minded in food innovation and more precisely about uh, microbes. So the topic here is uh, microbial diversity uh, in food. Uh, in general, when people think about microbes, they think about safety, food safety. Uh, the story here is a bit different. We see uh, microbes as uh, positive, um, positive microbes, um, and in particular, uh, we study how uh, these microbes could be uh, used for um, designing a new uh, food with a good impact uh, on uh, health. 
uh, in general, most of things, this information is not available in the structured database, but uh, it's buried and scattered in scientific publication. In this uh, specific case, uh, we uh, query uh, PubMed, uh, and we uh, found that uh, this information was uh, spread in 2.3 million reference and in more than thousand journals so it's obviously this is too many to be um, to be to be read so biologists need assistance to extract and process and aggregate the relevant information an important point here is to realize that in general these biologists do not want that much to read the paper to find relevant paper but first to identify this information to combine it with other experimental information or results of other analytics pipelines and then they have to go back to the paper to check uh, if the information is relevant uh, has been correctly extracted etc so what does that mean that means that we have to go one step beyond the classical information retrieval search engine we need more powerful semantic analysis and this is what i want to illustrate here uh, with the diversity of questions that biologists may ask this diversity um, uh, illustrated here in many different uh, questions uh, biopreservation of these researches, um, bacteria in cheese samples etc uh, this is so diverse that it is not possible to handle all this uh, question in the handicraft way mm -hmm. this means that some automatization some genericity uh, is required um, so let's focus on a specific uh, question about um, how to uh, design a new product mixed of uh, concumber and uh, yogurt sauce uh, by identifying new mi microbes able both of fermenting this uh, product and live in this uh, salted environment. So this is the almost true story of uh, Alexandra, a biologist uh, of INRA, uh, my, my research uh, institute, who asked to uh, PubMed, which is, is the main bibliography um, database for, for biologists and life science, uh, agriculture, health in general. So she asked PubMed about this question. Um, she translated uh, the um, uh, ability to live in salted environment in halo tolerance. This is a scientific word for uh, the ability to live uh, in salted uh, environment. And uh, PubMed answer uh, zero, zero document match your search terms. And obviously, Alessandra knows that there are a lot of uh, microbes uh, that are allotolerant and live in yogurt and concumber. So, as uh, many biologists, she came to uh, librarians and bioinformaticians to uh, ask uh, her question. And in this uh, story, she asked to Mary, her favorite bioinformatician. And Mary knows that there is no database, there is no classical search engine able to answer this question. She needs some semantic analysis able to uh, identify identify the entities in the text, the relationship between these entities, and to assign the entities to categories. And uh, she suggests to look at open-minded to process a uh, relevant corpus and extract uh, this uh, information about microbe and uh, concumber yogurt sauce. So I will show you now um, a video of uh, how uh, this uh, two uh, uh, person used uh, open-minded uh, to answer the, the question. So I will just change. Um, the tool. I hope it will work. Um, mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. Affiche quick time, okay. Um, you should be able to 
to see now uh, the the video. Oops. Okay. So she, um, Marie, so the bioinformatician, first connect to uh, open-minded services, as it had been shown by Anwaniki uh, before, and um, she, uh, uh, she connect and search for relevant corpora that could already exist in open-minded about food and microbe, and hopefully she found 10 results, and the first one was exactly uh, within the thematic uh, scope. So this is just a sample, but she can try uh, to check if it works correctly just with this, uh, with this small sample. So she selected, and now she needs an application. So she asked uh, to open minded for an application about uh, phenotype uh, um, of uh, microbe. Phenotype means properties of microbe. You remember that she was looking for allotorian microbes. And she finds this uh, nice application able to recognize a taxa, this means uh, microbes, habitat of these microbes, and phenotypes. So she selects the application and click to run it. So it may take some uh, time depending on the size of the corpus. Here it's very fast because this is just a sample. So she can now look uh, at the output. Um, so Marie, the bioinformatician, before giving the result to Alexandra, just check the quality uh, in, the, in the XMI format, which is the output format. And uh, uh, she found that um, entities like concombers were correctly extracted and tagged, labeled by open -minded. So now she can present the result to Alexandra in a more user-friendly um, uh, environment. So here you can see the result of Open Minded where um, the microbes are in uh, red. So there are a lot of them, like uh, Lactobacillus uh, cantarum. The habitat of this bacteria, so here it's food mainly uh, about concombers, uh, pickers, uh, vegetables are in blue, and then there are uh, relationships, these green relationships, which is between the, the entities. This is something uh, original and important, obviously, for this uh, use case. So this way she can check the, the relevance of the annotation. And in this example, Lactobacillus plantarum, a bacteria, is uh, um, growing in cucumber juice, which is exactly what um, Alexandra uh, needed. So now she can build her own corpus, a larger corpus than uh, the sample, and processes on the platform. Then the bioinformatician Alexandra can get all these result output of uh, Open19 and integrate the results in a, in a database so that uh, the results can be explored in a more uh, easy way uh, for uh, biology, by biologists we are not, who are not able, obviously, to read directly the XMI uh, output. So here is an example of such a database, it's a very simple uh, SQL uh, one, uh, with uh, all of these results. There are millions of them in this Example, there are two million uh, documents that have been uh, processed. And now she can ask a question, which microbes are living in concomber? And here is a selection of thousands uh, of them extracted by Open19, like Lactobacillus plantarum that we uh, already have uh, seen in, a, in an extract, which is actually living in a concomber. You can see here that there are many graphies, different graphies of Lactobacillus plantarum that uh, Open19 was able to, to deal with. So now she wants to know about the characteristic of this bacteria. What are this, the phenotypes? Is this bacteria able uh, to ferment your good? Yes. And is it able to live in a salted environment? Yes, it is allotolerant. So this is a good candidate for uh, Alexandra's study about this uh, concomber yogurt uh, sauce. And she can also just click and check uh, what the, the PubMed abstract said about uh, this bacteria. And she discovers there is another bacteria, uh, which is also relevant. And finally, she's just curious. She wants to check other vegetables where uh, Lactobacillus plantarum is living in, like bean. And you can uh, notice here 
this example that Open Minded was able to extract many different terms that all um, uh, refer to bin, like uh, Phaseolus vulgaris, uh, but does not contain the word bin as such. So this is the semantic analysis power of, uh, of Open Minded uh, illustrated here on the bin uh, example. So she also see that a beer, uh, bamboo shoot, uh, so many different uh, food products uh, can be fermented by the lactobacillus plantarum, which is interesting. So open minded can also help uh, Marie by providing training and support so that she can be autonomous and not uh, uh, need uh, to, um, to query uh, Alexandra. Uh, here is a list of the different uh, uh, training supports uh, available on um, Open Minded, but also on uh, Foster. So there is a full documentation about this uh, application, microbial uh, diversity, so that she can also share uh, expertise with other microbiologists in order uh, to run different uh, processes and use uh, different uh, corpora. So, so this is a uh, an illustration of how uh, microbiologists could uh, use uh, this uh, open-minded platform. So this is uh, this is it for the example. So I can uh, give the floor to uh, to Androniki or Mapet to to um, continue. Thanks, Claire. Okay, let's see if Mapet can um, also talk. To, can I ask if we have any questions? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Meanwhile, I'm making Muppet the presenter. Okay. And of um, course, you can prepare uh, questions for Muppet if you want, if you have, so she can try to answer. So, Muppet, we, we can uh, see your screen, but we can't hear you. Uh, I, I see that your microphone is on. But there's no sound from it. Okay, so Muppet is, is suggesting that we proceed with the Q&A. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the chat or if you, if you feel brave enough to uh, make us hear your voice, just unmute yourself and, and yeah, ask directly a question to the speakers. Uh, if not, um, or while you are thinking about any questions, um, Andronika, was Muppet our last speakers, or was there the chance to add something yes. else? Yeah, uh, but we also have Richard. Uh, Richard uh, is also available. So Richard is a PDM expert. So and Dimitris is also here. Uh, Dimitris Galan is Richard. Uh, so if you have any questions also on TDM. Uh, remember, I showed you the user manual. So, open minded is serving content providers, researchers, and TDM developers, and hopefully SMEs. So, if you feel you belong in one of these categories, uh, feel free to ask. We'll provide presentations and the links uh, so we can share them later. Can I share my screen for a while, for a minute? Well, uh, yeah, just let me. Yeah. Okay, enable you. Um, I just want to remind you, meanwhile, that um, the recording of the webinar will be made available 
on the open air website in the webinar sections next week okay so this is the user manual uh, so that's why i mentioned if you belong to one of these categories uh, if you're an sme you can still find information so if you're a researcher uh, you can find you can have a step-by-step -step instructions manual very easy to understand so it will guide you through the process so you can select the choice like i want to run a register application then this is what i have to follow and we also have hyperlinks so you can find extra information uh, you can find support so there is a ticketing system so we will receive your request if you're a tdm developer again you can read the specifications what you should do uh, to make sure uh, what you provide is uh, following our guidelines if you have any question on tdm uh, we have uh, many people to support you so don't hesitate just try also to use the platform try to go to open-minded search the applications we have search the corpora search the tdm components you can play somehow around you can you can check what is available how can i build a new application out of existing components or how can i uh, create something totally new that it's not there so i want to register i want to upload i want to make it reusable so offer it so others can use it also we have health text tips and of course always don't be afraid send us an email uh, we are here this is from me so i'm sorry that Muppet couldn't do it. yeah but uh, we can in in case she she's okay with it i we can yeah. I think that we can make a little more air presentation as well um so that more questions might arise okay perfect thank you very okay much. if there's no other questions uh i think we can close the webinar and i would like to thank you very much uh for being here despite our small technical issues. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.